Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. My name is Marv Fox Jr. This is Become the Podcast. How do you become anything you dream, you declare, and you commit? And success is your next breath. So, was uh, home all day with the kids. Um, and uh, just looking for inspiration and uh, looking for something to talk about. Um, and I uh, was hoping I would get a chance to work out because working out is when I can kind of lock into the lock into the zone and get something. You know, it's like my go to. Like any time that I need an idea, if I work out, the idea typically is found in my workouts. You know, I, I'm able to see clear. I get rid of some bad energy. You know, the, the clouds kind of separate. I'm able to see the sunshine and see the sky and and and, and, and a vision and an, and an ideal appears. And so that happened. Uh, kids gave me a little bit of took a, took a took a nap. Kids gave me some free time to myself. They were playing with the neighbors, and I got a chance to flip my tire a hundred times and do some other uh, arm work. And from there, I was I came up with this idea. So I'm thinking about this idea of um, competition versus winning, and also I'm going through a situation right now where my ten year old son likes winning more than than than. Than competing And I see it in a lot of different areas of his life Whether it's video games, whether it's real life Or whatever the case may be He wants to win And is not as interested In competing Now I know that You know, you might be saying well winning is good Who doesn't want to win Winning is good but you have to I think you want to You need to value competition first And you want to win Through being highly competitive some people just want to win. They don't care who they win against. It could be a lesser opponent. It could be a person who's nowhere near on their level, but they'll accept the win because they just want to win. But when they get matched up against somebody who's of equal caliber or maybe somebody who's just a slightly better, slightly above, slightly stronger, a little bit better, a little bit stronger, faster, quicker, whatever the case may be, it's like and as soon as they see that they can't just dominate or can't, you know, create some leverage from from like the opening tip. They tend to, you know, fade. Or it's like, a, well, they'll just they'll rock and roll as long as the, the conditions are good. But as soon as the conditions become less than ideal, then they tend to fade, and they they eventually will quit, or they'll come up with they'll they, somehow or they'll they'll find a way to, you know, not not perform at the optimum level, not compete on the highest level. I'm seeing this with my son and I'm I'm working through the words and I'm working through my own frustration. I'm working through my own frailties. I'm working through my, my own my own narrative of how I developed into someone who was competitive and loved the uh, you know comp competing and and, and, and and understood the value of a good butt whooping from time to time. I'm working through that and, and sometimes I'm good in terms of giving my son the type of stories and narratives he needs to hear, then sometimes I'm just I'm immature and I just say crazy things to him because I just want some sort of reaction out of them and a lot of times you know when we when we are kind of trying to you know give somebody you know we're trying to we're trying to connect with somebody or or, or give somebody a piece of our mind or we want people to kind of respond in a certain way and they don't then we just kind of up the ante on how crazy we can be and you know and eventually we end up saying something stupid so I'm, i'm going from being very sophisticated and 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 cerebral in my approach to being sometimes very primitive and just you know, stupid in my approach, but it's just that 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 it's just wanting your kids to be better than you. You know that sometimes can take you to some different places. But I was thinking about um, competition versus winning, and I was thinking about Wizards Mike. I was thinking about Wizards Mike, and um, you know, I was thinking about the idea that. Wizards Mike sometimes gets put in this light that's unfair and I think underappreciated. And so you'll hear you hear, you know, guys talk about the Michael Jordan versus LeBron James narrative, right? And they'll sometimes put in Mike's Wizards days and then they'll say, Well, we we don't want to talk about the Wizards days. Those those don't count. As though they were so bad. You know what I'm saying? And I always appreciated Mike's Wizards days, not as much as his 
whole body of work in Chicago, but I really appreciated those two Wizards, the Wizards days, because he was still able to be effective. He was still able to score 20 plus points a game. He was still, I think, a legitimate all star. I don't think Michael Jordan got the nine and somebody else got snub, snubbed. I think Michael Jordan legitimately was the all star. I think if Le- Michael Jordan was putting up, was Michael Jordan, if Paul Pierce was putting up Michael Jordan's numbers, he would be an all star. If Ray Allen was putting up Michael Jordan's numbers, he would have been an all star. I think Michael Jordan was legit all star. Um, you know, sometimes. You know, guys from teams that aren't doing so well, aren't doing so hot, they still go to the All-Star game because statistically they're competing. You know what I'm saying? And and, and Michael Jordan during those years was competing. Was his numbers down a little bit? Yeah. But, you know, when Mike was able to play... On get, you know on the first game of a back to back or or any game where he they, they, you know he didn't they have off days, Mike's numbers are solid. They're solid. You can compete. You can put them up with just about anybody except for like somebody like Tracy McGrady at that time, who was probably leading the league in scoring. But when you talk about uh, you know just the games where Mike didn't have to play a back to back, Mike was pretty effective. Mike was probably twenty five, twenty six points a game, um, probably just a shade under fifty percent. I mean. He was pretty good. Still rebounding the basketball. I think his, his his numbers from Chicago was probably six a game. I would say he was probably five a game, and he probably been in maybe probably around six because he was playing a small four position, which means he was closer to the basket. Um, so I would imagine that he was still rebounding the ball well. And then if you talk about assists, I think he became even smarter in terms of assists. He played with some pretty good players. He played with Richard Hamilton one year. He played with uh, Jerry Stackhouse for one year. Um, and – so he still played with oh he played with uh, I think Christian the Christian Lane play with him I can't remember but he still played with some all star caliber players that could knock down a shot when they got open or, or guys who could catch it and, and have the instincts to catch it and, and finish and score so he wasn't playing with bums that couldn't do anything so he's playing with some decent basketball players that knew how to catch the basketball make a make a quick read make a play and so with that being said I think Mike Mike's career for his assist product might have been around five or six but i would imagine he was still rebounding and assisting at the same clip the thing that had come down was the scoring because normally mike was known for scoring 30 points a game and now he was probably you know low 20s but still doing it effectively uh especially on you know games that run back to back but the thing that was kind of like as i was thinking about wizards mike the thing that was impressing me was you know he came back for the competition. You know, they talk about him coming back for the sake of, you know, trying to teach these guys how to win. And, and not necessarily how to win. I think winning just kind of oftentimes is the, is the, is the key buzzword, right? But really was how to teach these guys how to compete. He went to teach these guys how to p- compete. How do you, and that's why he got him brought back Charles Oakley. Charles Oakley was a vet, never ever played an athletic game. So Charles Oakley was able to do his job at, at at a at a you know late in his career because he understood you know angles he understood you know how to keep his body together he understood how to play defense and he under, you know he just understood the game he can still hit an open shot he can still make a put back he can still create leverage you know he can still carve out space um on a rebound and still be effective at rebounding was he get, probably getting 10 boards a game probably not but he Mike brought Charles Oakley there to teach these guys how to be better how to be professionals so it was all about come to practice early get your work in whether that's stretching whether that's weight training whether whether that's conditioning whether that's open shots whether that's just find out come to the trainer and get yourself looked at take care of these little bumps and bruises that you know can lead to a bigger bump and bruise if you don't take care of the small bump and bruise but here they understood that right and so they they understood how how to how to conduct yourself in practice how to compete how to play right uh, how to how to conduct yourself in games? You know, what I'm saying tight games. How do how do you compete? How do you keep your composure so that you can put yourself in position to read the game uh, the way you need to, so you can make good decisions down the stretch? Uh, how do you respond after a win? How do you respond after a lose? How do you respond after a couple wins? How do you respond after a couple losses? How do you respond after you know being in a really good team or you know losing at the buzzer to a really good team? How do you respond to losing to a bad team? How do you respond to losing blowing out a good team? You know. 
all these different variables and nuances of the game, Mike brought Charles Oakley to teach these guys how to compete. Now, we often talk about that, but I think one of the key things that drove Mike to coming back was the competitiveness. See, Mike, when he played, I can't remember too many premier guards that Mike had to go against. Okay, and this doesn't lessen Mike's um, legacy because he went against classic teams. He had to um, go against very good players, and although that player might have been a Charles Barkley playing at the four, or Mike was at the two, or whether that was playing against Perry, Gary Payton and 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 at the one and and and. Sean Kemp at the four, whether it was going against the New York Knicks and playing against Patrick Ewing at the five. Mike, you know, Mike never had too many uh, classic battles at his position. And many people will say, well, see, that's that's why, you know, you have to you have to kind of be conservative with Mike's legacy as the greatest ever. You know, who, who did he play against? But you can also say, well, Mike was so great that he made these other two guards not look so hot, right? So he had an epic match, epic, epic battle, I think in 98 when he won seven games with the Pacers and that was with Reggie Miller. Reggie Miller was a formidable guard, but, but you know, in any other... If Mike wasn't in the league, who knows how what, what, how Reggie Miller would have been perceived? Not necessarily if he would have been the the greatest two guard ever, but Mike kept Reggie out of a lot of All Star games, right? And then you know there was Joe Dumars. Joe Dumars was really formidable when the Bad Boys when the Bad Boys. But once you know the Bad Boys broke up, you know Dumars was still a good matchup for him, but without the help of you know. Lambeer, John Sally, David, Dennis Robin, and the rest of those guys, you know, you didn't have that, that back line to, to drive Mike, Matt, Mike in two so that he can, um, you know, kind of basically play good defense on Mike. But, but Joe Dumas was a good two guard. Obviously, the, the, the biggest, um, one of the other, other guys that Mike had to battle, uh, during his playing days was, um, uh, Miss Richmond. Miss Richmond always played on a bad team. You know what I'm saying? So the matchups were never as marquee as they should have been. And obviously no one was checking for Sacramento. And then even when he – yeah, no one was checking, checking for Sacramento. Um, and, and he was only in Golden State for a little bit. But you only play those two te- teams twice a year with them being on e- different coasts. But he was always a good matchup for Mike because although he wasn't as athletic, he was still sneaky athletic, but he was so strong. Uh, Mitch, Rich- Mitch Richmond's nickname was The Rock. So he always was a, a tough matchup for Mike uh, because he was so strong and he was a shoot, he was a shooter. So and what you don't see a lot is a physical shooter. Uh, um, Eric Gordon is a physical shooter. That's a that's a combination that's typically they don't coexist. You know, either you're physical score or you are a a, a shooter. And, and typically, you're trying to create space so you can shoot, right? But like Reggie Miller, like Ray Allen, like um, Rip Hamilton, guys who want to come off screens, get the space, and then shoot. Very seldom do you see a guy who's physical in a, sh- in, a in a shooter. I mean, even Carmelo Anthony, he's a physical score. And he just so happens to shoot the ball well, and he, he could shoot the ball well when he would get going because he was getting so many touches. But you never, we didn't, we didn't see too many physical guys that want to, to punish you offensively and then score the ball or shoot the ball. And that's what Mitch Richmond was, right? He was a legitimate shooter, you know what I'm saying? And so he always gave Mike problems too because Mike couldn't bully him, and Mike was able to bully a lot of these other two guards. Uh, but then obviously the 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 the, the, the most compelling matchup throughout Mike's career at the two guard position was Clyde Drexler and he he definitely created you know the separation you know uh during the 92 playoffs but I think the reason why Mike came back is because he saw Tracy McGrady 6'8 super athletic got all the skills was baby basically Mike with a better handle you know Mike's ability with a better handle okay Kobe that was basically his replica. Ray Allen comes into the game. Ray Allen, 6'5", super complete player. And that was Team Jordan. And Team Jordan, back in the day, their thing was complete. They wanted complete basketball players. And you look at everybody that was Team Jordan, there were guys that could basically dribble, pass, score, move out the ball, and catch. Right? So, Ray Allen was one of those guys. Eddie Jones was one of those guys, right? So you had all these budding superstars. Oh, and you still had the Reggie Miller still still was playing. You still had a uh, Mitch Richmond was still playing. And you still had all these young guys that were starting to come into the league that were developing as premier two guards. And I think Mike 
got so competitive because he said, I got to know what it feels like to play these guys, right? Another guy, uh, Paul Pierce, Vince Carter, all these guys start buttoning up. And it's funny, Mike didn't have these guys to play against throughout his career, but those guys were watching them. And all these guys grew up wanting to be like Mike. They wanted to jump like Mike. They wanted the mid-range jumper like Mike. They wanted to lead like Mike. All these guys were guys that you could, for the most part, build your team around. A two-guard who could do it all. You can you can run the offense through them. They can catch and score. They can catch dribble and score. They can they can all they could all post up. They could all shoot the three. They could all shoot the mid-range. I mean, they could do everything. They could set guys up. They could handle a little bit. You know, remember Mike in '89 played the point guard. That's what made Mike so complete that he could also score score but also be a, uh, a, a, a a point guard right well all these guys had that same thing you think about Vince not necessarily the point guard skills but Trace McGrady big point guard had that ability Ray Allen could definitely switch him over to the two one let him run the offense Kobe Bryant same thing um Paul Pierce more of a score but all these guys were, were were so complete and I think Mike was so competitive he said I gotta know what this feels like I gotta know what it what it feels like to play against these guys and this is why you love Mike he was so competitive that he didn't care about the legacy he didn't care about the legacy he the legacy was on the line he didn't care he was like listen I'd rather take a butt whooping and see what I got against these guys versus keep my legacy intact and wonder and just wonder so he went up against the Tracy McGrady. When Tracy McGrady was young, I don't even think Tracy McGrady was like when the years when Mike was in the league at the, for the Wizards. I don't even think Mike was. I don't even think Tracy McGrady, Tracy McGrady was twenty seven years old. We're talking about a young Tracy McGrady. We're talking about a guy who's just operating off of skill and just elite athleticism. He hadn't got to the point where he became more cerebral and and and, and was more you know um, thoughtful about when to attack. He was just in attack mode. Talk about a young Kobe. That's when Kobe was in attack mode. Kobe wasn't thinking about oh well, let me be more conservative. Let me you know he was just attacking. Same thing. Paul Pierce. They on attack mode. Ray Allen just coming to the league. He's in attack mode. Right. All these guys and these guys were in the prime. Remember Mike retired in ninety eight. When Mike came back, I think it was 2001 to 2003 season, because I think 2003, 2004, that's when LeBron came into the league. So you got 98, 90, you got 98, 99, 2000, 2001. So some of those guys have been into the league for at least three years, right? And these guys were on their way to being Hall of Fame players. So you know that the, the, the development was happening rapidly. Like Ray Allen got into the league right away, was a, was a formidable two guard. Kobe Bryant, although, you know, Kobe Bryant by his second year was an all-star. You know what I'm saying? And so he came in the league in 96. So by the time Mike was in the Wizards days, I think Kobe had already had championships by now. But he wanted to know what it felt like to play against these guys. He was so competitive. He wanted to go against these guys at, at their best. And he didn't mind risking his legacy. And he he didn't mind taking a butt whooping. I mean, you got to know, man. As great as Michael Jordan is, you got to know that. Listen, Mike was playing on one leg. He, he, you know, he's going. He's thirty eight, thirty nine, and forty. Hey, you going against twenty, twenty mid? You know, guys in their twenties. You know what I'm saying? And they say you don't reach your peak. You don't reach your peak until twenty eight, twenty seven, twenty seven, twenty eight. So now you're going against guys in their prime. But he, he wanted to know, and I, and I applaud Mike for that. And because of Mike's competitiveness, because he wasn't afraid to compete, he wasn't afraid to look foolish in the in the in in in, in, his, in, in, in being competitive. He he was able to win. And then you start looking at today's players. You start looking at today's players. And obviously, everybody wants to win championships. And I don't know who started this. I think sometimes it's the TNT game. They kind of clown Charles Barkley because he didn't win any championships. And anytime they have a conversation about winning championships, Kenny talks and Shaq talks. But Charles Barkley, he, you know, he has a limited voice in that conversation. And I think, you know, with that in conjunction with, um, you know, who's the greatest ever? And then you start bringing in Bill Russell because you're like, well, we got to add Bill Russell into the conversation because he's got all these rings. He's got 11 of them. But we don't talk about how there was only eight to 10 teams back then. And, you know, Russell was a, off, a defensive force, but he wasn't an offensive force. And so to see somebody like Mike come into the league, right, and dominate the way that he did, um, dominate the way that he did, from an off as a, as a guard and, and dominate from a scoring standpoint and be able to take the basketball out of bounds and then go down and score, Mike became the premier 
symbol of 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 winning. Not to mention he has six championship rings. So all this is happening where we start to talk about, you know, they, we're seeing Barkley every Thursday, right? And then we're seeing all the guys talk about championships. And then we start talking about, well, who's the greatest ever? And then we start talking about Mike. And we start talking about Mike's rings. And then we bring in Bill Russell into the fold because he's got 11. And then all of a sudden, the narrative around winning became championships, rings. How many do you got? And then we get somebody like, so now we're searching for a superstar once Mike leaves. And then Kobe comes on. And then Kobe compares himself to Mike he's chasing Mike's goals and he gets five of them and he's only measuring himself by championships not by performances not by points not by stats and statistics and stuff like that you know it was never ever that it was always how many does Mike have how many can I get how many can I get to Mike's number and can I get by him he didn't care about getting 11 I don't even think like people don't even care about the 11 championship that's like unworldly you know what I'm saying especially in today's climate and with the competition and stuff like that they don't even care about that but everybody wants that six number because you get five you call you call you get more than you get more than three I think you get you get I think bird had three magic had five now you get the six now you pass you surpass Mike you know you you, you gotta now you gotta talk to, you gotta talk about that person being in the conversation is Mike we got and, and I think I think if you got similar stats and and you can get you know six championships, they want to talk to you. And they want to talk to you about being in a conversation with Mike. So I think to some degree, there was all those different things that created this narrative that in order for you to win, it's got to be about the championship. So now you have these guys who no longer want to fight the good fight and compete, right? They want to just jump ship and they want to win a championship. That's it. Let me just win a championship. And I get it. At the end of your career, I get it. Right? Charles Barkley tried to do that when he went to the Houston Rockets, right? He said, Listen, man, I I I I carried the 76ers for many, many years, right? He was close to the end of his prime. He was at the end of his prime when he went to Phoenix, right? He goes to Phoenix that first year, 93, to have an awesome year, 94, and eh, right, 94, not so good. And then after that, it was basically downhill. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about a 6'4", explosive, incredible athlete. But by 94, they came into the league in 84-85. So that's his 10th year. That's his 10th year. They say the average NBA career is 13. 13. So you're talking about a guy who basically spent his prime, majority of his prime, his young years in Philadelphia. He had about three or four good years in, in Phoenix. That team fell off quickly right Kevin Johnson fell off Barkley was on the he was on a downhill of his prime and could no longer carry a team that way and before you know it it was over so he said well let me join Hakeem on the tail end of his career because Hakeem came on 84 too so now you at you add you, you join another old dude right not to mention I think Hakeem played at least three years in college so he was super old I mean he wasn't super old but he was old and then you got a you had you had an aging Scottie Pippen who Scottie Pippen was on the he, he I think he might have been on the he might have been on the downside of his career too. I think he went. No, not yet, not yet. I think Scotty went from Chicago to Houston. I think Houston to Portland. Not sure. I can't remember. But that's that's what Carl Charles Barkley was doing. I want to get a ring. I get it. David West. David West. Before he got his two rings with. Um, before he got his two rings with uh, Golden State, he played in San Antonio. San Antonio was in the thick of things. They still had Tim Duncan, and they still had young talent. Tony Parker still in his prime on the tail end. Ginobili on his pr- t- on the tail end of his prime. He still had some good players. So he decided to go play for San Antonio because he wanted to get a ring. I get it when you're on the tail end. But when you a horse, you when you're a young horse man, you got you got young legs, man, and man, you can run for days and play for days. Th- that's when that's when we like to see our 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 biggest and brightest stars compete. Like, let me see if you can carry the team. Let me see if you can carry the team. And that's what we got out of Mike. We got a young dude who, from the time he came into the league, it was about competition. He was competing with himself, right? He was competing with everyone else at first, and then he got with um, Phil Jackson, and Phil Jackson taught him how to compete um, with himself, compete compete with the, the, the idea of the triangle. It's, it, can be, it, it can be highly effective if you, if you compete against, you know, if you compete with yourself to make it perfect, if you compete with yourself to find all the different ways in which you can utilize it to amplify your scoring. 
And then finally, Mike got it. He was like, okay, I'm not going to worry about competing against these guys. I'm going to master the, the triangle. I'm going to master my own skill set. Then I'm going to master the triangle. I'm going to optimize all the options in the triangle. And then after that, you know, winning became winning became a byproduct of his willingness to compete with himself, compete with himself and master his skill, compete with the triangle. Right. And then and then and then the next thing, the last thing is, you know, by way of competing against yourself to be the best basketball player you can be, then you then then you 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 start to win. You start to win the matchup. You start to win the season. You start to win awards. Then you start to win uh, team awards. You start to gain more team success. And LeBron's LeBron's kind of figuring it out too. He's starting to compete against himself. He's he's he started competing against himself, and I feel like that's why all of a sudden his shot became more dependable in these clutch situations because he he understood the value of competing with himself. But that's what we got with Mike. We got a guy who was so caught up in competing and competing with himself and competing with the notion of the triangle and competing to, to better his skill set that he won through the through competition and he wanted to he wanted to compete against the best. He didn't want to go join the best. He wanted to compete against the best. And that's why it's so tough to kind of let Mike go. That's why it's so tough to have somebody like Kevin Durant come in there and really not appreciate it. That's why it's so tough to have, you know, LeBron put up these numbers, but you still can't appreciate them because now we're talking about LeBron. Where is he going to go next to get another ring? You know what I'm saying? Where, where did he go the first time to get a ring? We didn't see Mike leave. We saw Mike compete. We saw Mike compete. The only, the main guy that was with him this whole, that whole time was Scotty. Scotty was there. When he left and Scotty was there when he came back. When he came back, Horace was, gone. Horace was gone. You know what I'm saying? Same thing. When Mike came back for the for the shortened season, for his shortened season, when he came back after baseball, he 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 it was I'm I I may not be in great shape. I may not be in basketball shape, but he was still willing to compete. Yeah, Horace isn't there. He could have easily said, you know what, I'm gonna come back, I'm gonna start I'm gonna start training now, I'm gonna take on the preseason. I'm going to take on the preseason with everyone else. I'm going to work hard in the summertime, and then I'm going to get myself. No, but he said, I'm going to jump in here right now. I'm going to compete. I'm going to compete. No no fear. I'm just going to compete right now. I don't know what I got, but I'm going to find out. And because he because he was willing to compete, he found out what he didn't have, and he was able to work, work on it in the summertime. But he competed. That's what we saw with, with Mike. We saw a guy who was willing to compete. When he came back, a little bit of a different team. Ron Harper was there. No more B.J. Armstrong. No more John Paxson. Dennis Robin was there. No more Horace Grant. Right? All of his bigs were gone. I think Casey Livingston. Um, David, I mean, Cartwright was definitely out of the league by then. There was another um, There was another guy. I can't remember. Another another guy. Uh, Stacey King. Those guys were gone. Now it was Luke Longley. It was Bill Winnington. And later they got James Edwards. They got Robert Parrish. They had to get all these guys for Shaq. And you had Dennis Rodman. Those were, those were his guys. And then in, 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 the, in, the, in the biggest addition was now they had a 6'10", Croatian sensation named Tony Kukoc. But this was his team. And it was all about competing. Okay, all the guys that I want championships with, you think about it. It could be very intimidating to, to, to win with a group of guys. And then now you come into a team and remember, he came in during the middle of the season. He came in and said, I'm going to compete with these guys, and we're going to find a way to win the championship. We're going to see what we got. They go into the offseason. I don't think they made very many acquisitions. I think maybe the only acquisition they let go, they let Pete Myers go. And then after that, they were off and running. Mike was going to compete with these guys. I'm going to teach these guys how to compete. Because up until that point, I don't think anybody had any championships. Parrish, but Parrish wasn't a premier player. He wasn't, you know. But other than that, all those other guys, they didn't have championships. Ron Harper didn't have a championship. Coney Kukoc didn't have a championship in the league. But Mike was all about the competition. And so it's tough, man, when Kevin Durant goes to a 73 team to win. It's tough. It's tough when we hear about LeBron, where he's going to go now so he can hopefully get a ring. It's tough. It's tough hearing what Paul George is going to do. Like, you know, like, you know, where are you going to, you know, I want you to compete, man. Compete. Figure it out. Get your game right. Find a way to be tough in the clutch. And now guys just want to go wherever they want to go. And I get it. These guys have a free will. If you're in a toxic work environment, why not go somewhere else? 
in corporate America, if someone has a, a job and they say, listen, I can, I can leave this job here, keep my money, but do, do the same, do, 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 I can, imp- I can, I can improve my, my portfolio. I can do less work, right? I can, and I, I can do, I, but I can do less work, but still make the same amount of money. Yeah. So I can increase my portfolio. So I can, I can put, I can say I did this, 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 and this, and this. But somehow, even though I'm doing more stuff, I'm still doing less work, right? I can still get recognized for it and make the same amount of money, if not more. That's Kevin Durant. I can, I can still make the same amount of money, which he's got such, he's, he's such a talent. He can make the money wherever he wants to go, wherever, wherever he goes. But I can make this money, right? And then on top of it, I can play one-on-one basketball because Clay's on one corner, steps in the other. So you mean to tell me I can increase my portfolio? I can, I can get individual awards i can get championships but somehow do less work yeah i'm signing up for that right from a, if, if that's if that's a you know compared to a corporate setting but when we do it in the, when we do it in the sports setting it's tough but it's tough because we saw mike compete with, with whoever he had and even when he went to washington maybe his whole thing was to compete Maybe his whole thing was to eventually get back on the floor, and he was just looking for a team that he could do it. Maybe the whole thing was about Mike getting back on the floor. Maybe he went to Washington. That was the whole thing. I want to get back on the floor. But who do you want? Where you want to go? You can't go to a market that's so terrible, right? You can't go to some market like I don't know who's terrible. LA Clippers were probably terrible. You can't go to that market, right? You can't go to you. He definitely, he's not going to go to a team that was like figuring it, like that was really like rocking and rolling. So he wasn't going to go to like a New York around that time. He wasn't going to go to um, uh, 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 Indiana at that time. He wasn't going to go to uh, a Miami at that time. Definitely wasn't going to go to the East Coast and like join the Lakers. But he wanted to go somewhere where listen, we got a few pieces. We got just enough where I feel like I can, you know, we can win some games. Right? Maybe that was it. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe he just simply joined the Wizards because that seemed like a good business move. But as he started looking at me, he says, you know what? I think I can help these guys. And he jumped in and risked the legacy all for the sake of competition. Not winning, but for the sake of competition. And then now we're in an era where we look at guys and you ask the question, do, you, do these guys value winning more so than competition? Do you guys just want to win? Now you can say that with, you can say that about Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant just wants to win. Kevin Durant just wants to win. And now he's out of championships. Now at some point he may go somewhere else and then he may decide to compete. Now it's easier to compete because the pressure's off. It's easier to compete because now no matter what anybody says, he can say, Listen, I got two finals MVPs and I got some rings. Same thing about LeBron. LeBron, that sec that championship, although that that championship against the Warriors was uh, incredible, you know, being down 3-1 and then coming back to win it. That was incredible, but it was much easier to compete because at the end of the day, he could say, I already got two. I already got two. Like, no one can take that away from me. I got two. So no, no one can take that away. But, he, but it was easier to compete after he went to go with somebody else and get those rings. And, I, and I look, what he did in Miami, that was tough. That was tough too. That was tough in a lot of different ways. That was tough, but he still he got tired of competing. He just wanted to win. Like I just want to, I just want, I just gonna go, want to go somewhere where I can get a ring. And at that time, you know, now what they did seems small in comparison to what Kevin Durant has done because LeBron joined up with his friends to to win a championship, right? But he didn't join a juggernaut. Same thing with the with the with the with the go with the um Boston Celtics. They weren't as bad as as they you know what they did didn't seem as bad as LeBron because those guys were at the tail end of the career. They they were reaching their prime. Like Ray Allen was reaching his prime. He wasn't not by the time he got to Boston. Ray, Ray Allen was not the one on one two guard. You know he was he was now more becoming more of a a, a, a catch and shoot guy. That was like the first generation of his 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 his, his stay his um him, him being a, a catch and shoot guy versus a scoring two guard. Same thing with with with, with uh, Garnett. Garnett was on the tail end of his career. You know what I'm saying? So now he was asked to play defense and score a little bit. 
You know what I'm saying? And then they had Paul Pierce, who was like the the, the guy who kind of stayed in his role. You keep continue to score. Garnett, you lead, defend, give us some post presence, and Ray Allen, you're going to stretch the floor out for us. We're going to put some other shooters out there to make sure that we give Paul Pierce an opportunity to score, and then we'll get Rondo in there. You're going to break everybody down and, and play pick-and-roll basketball and distribute the basketball. But that didn't seem as bad as what LeBron did. You know what I'm saying? So we kind of applaud Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, and all those guys because they were on the tail end of their career. LeBron left when he was at his prime. And granted, was the front office doing what they were supposed to do to help him out? Not really. But he didn't compete. He left because he wanted to get his win. He wanted to get some wins. So, with that being said, as I was thinking about competition and the value of competition, um, it's a thin line between, you know, winning and competing. And doing what's best for you and sometimes taking the, the, the tough road for the sake of legacy, for the sake of your own sanity. I would imagine no matter what Kevin, Kevin Durant does as a warrior, he will never be appreciated and his, 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 his awards will never, never truly be appreciated because he's playing for a juggernaut. He, he went to a 73 and... Uh, I can't count a 73 and what's it? 73 and 19. I think that's it. Yeah. He went with 73 and 19. No, no one, no one cares that he's winning the finals MVP. He just got done. He just got done steamrolling the best player on earth. <laughs> that lets you know how good his team is. And he knows deep down inside he can he can celebrate and he can pour the champagne and he's happy. But you got to know psychologically is 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 bittersweet to him because he knows the way that the world celebrated LeBron for beating the Warriors, the way that Stephen Curry, the world celebrated Stephen Curry for beating the the the, the uh the, the Cavaliers the first time, despite despite. Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love going down. The way they celebrated celebrated him is not the way that the world celebrates Kevin Durant. The way that they celebrated uh, Mike is not the way that they celebrate Kevin Durant. Everybody puts a even even some of those guys who talk on television and, and kind of support him. They, they 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 put an asterisk next to his name because they're like, bro, come on, man, this is too easy, man. You know, these people, they might say, man, you could be you could be half the player Kevin Durant is, and you would still get championships. Because that team is just so good. So, it's a fine line, man. It's a fine line between, again, wanting to compete and put yourself through the rigor of competition for the sake of legacy, for the sake of seeing what you got, versus abandoning ship and saying, I just want to win. And position yourself by a winner. But knowing that the workload isn't the same, and the respect that you that, that the, the respect might not be the same. But at the end of the day, I think that's why it's so tough to let Mike go as the the best to ever do it, because he competed and he took on all challengers, and even in his Wizards days, he didn't stop being thirty eight. And being sometimes 10 years younger than some of his competition, he let that stop him. He decided, I'm going to take those guys on too. And although his legacy might be tarnished you know, to some people, to me, I think it solidified him as one of the greatest competitors we've ever seen. Um, because you knew he, he knew he was going into the Lions then. Not as fast, not as quick, not as strong. He had to rely on his smarts. Had to rely on intangibles, confidence, things of that nature. And some days he looked great. Sometimes he didn't look great. But you can applaud his courage and you can applaud his competitive spirit. That's it, man. I'm done. Hope that makes sense. No nuggets, really. No, no, no points of contact. Just more so an observation. My name is Mar Fikes Jr. L. Got to go back to this. Greatness lives on the edge of death. I'm not afraid to die. I will fight for my dreams, I will celebrate my dreams, and I will die for my dreams. Thoughts are things, and everything starts off as a thought first and springs from a place of mindfulness and clarity. My name is Marfax Jr., and I am done.